We now come to a concept that is absolutely crucial in understanding the entire Levitical, tabernacle, priesthood, temple, sacrificial system. And that's the concept of holiness. So that's what we're going to look at in this episode. And if you haven't seen the previous episodes in this series on Mount Sinai, I'll put links to all of them in the description below. Go ahead and check those out either before you watch this video or you can watch it after. Chronology is not that important since these are largely topical videos. And while you're clicking around here on the channel, go ahead and click that like button and the subscribe button. That really helps us out. Leave a comment on any videos that you find that are thought-provoking or helpful. All of that really helps us grow this channel. Our goal, as we've said throughout this series, is by the end of this year, by the end of 22, to reach 5,000 subscribers. So you can help us get there by subscribing if you haven't already and telling other people about Disciple Dojo so they can subscribe as well. The more subscribers we have, the easier it is to keep this content as well as all of our resources freely available here at Disciple Dojo. Okay, let's take a deep dive into the concept of holiness in Israel. When I was a kid, now my dad's a pastor, and so I grew up obviously every Sunday in church. And every week, dad would have children's time. Those of you that grew up in Methodist churches around the late 70s, early 80s, you're probably very familiar with children's time. That's when basically the pastor invites all the kids in the congregation up. They sit down on the steps in front of the altar or somewhere in the sanctuary. And the pastor gives a little object lesson for the kids. Tells a little story, shows an illustration, something like that. Then... If the kids are good, they may get a piece of candy, and then they get sent off on their way to Sunday school, children's church, or whatever that church does for children. So children's time always involved some type of little object lesson. When I was really little, I was probably maybe four. I don't know if I was in kindergarten yet. I might have been, but I feel like I was around four or five. My dad asked me if he could borrow one of my Hot Wheels cars. I had a bunch of Hot Wheels cars as a kid, and he said he needed to use it for children's time. So the next day in church, he had my little Hot Wheel car, and he had all of us, and there were only a handful of us. It was a small kind of inner city storefront church. But he had those of us kids come up, and he said, do you know what repentance means? And we're like four. No, we don't know what repentance means. So he took my little Hot Wheel car, and, and there was like the altar rail where uh, people could come up and pray. And he took the little car, and he said, imagine this car driving along, and then it turns around and drives the other way. And that's all he did. Just took the car, turned it around, drove it the other way. And he said, that's what repentance means. Repentance doesn't mean saying you're sorry. It means changing your behavior. It means turning and going in the opposite direction from the way you were going. That's what it means to repent. Very simple, easy to understand. I, it, it's remained with me for literally 40 years now. It was an object lesson. That little Hot Wheel car doing a U-turn and driving the other way solidified in my mind what the concept of repentance means. Well, the tabernacle for Israel is like that little Hot Wheel car, but on a much bigger scale. The whole point of the tabernacle was to ingrain into Israel's minds collectively what it meant to be in covenant with a holy God. It was a visual representation in numerous ways of God's holiness and Israel's call to be holy. So we've seen in previous videos how the tabernacle was graded in terms of who had access to what parts. You know, you had the worshipers could be in the courtyard, then only the priests could be in the holy place, and then only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year. So there was this graded access, and we saw how this was analogical to the graded access that Mount Sinai itself had when God met with Israel there, and you had all the people camped around the base, and then you had Aaron and his sons and the elders coming partially up the mountain, and then at the top of the mountain, you had Moses meeting face to face with God. And so this is one of the ways that the tabernacle signified holiness. See, holiness and the related concept of purity or cleanliness was, was a dynamic force in Israel, so to speak. Now, now, not legitimately, it's not like the force, but theologically, holiness, purity, cleanliness, however you want to term them, was seen as having to do with the realms in which Israel lived and dwelled and the realm in which God lived and dwelled. In the world of ancient Israel, everything fell into one of two categories. It was either holy or it was common. There was holiness and there was commonness. 
So people, implements, places, these were the two spheres that everything was divided into. Now, within the common, you could have things that were common and pure or clean, I'm using these words interchangeably, and then things that were common that were impure or unclean. So you had in terms of holiness within the bifurcation of the common and the holy, you had things that were unclean or impure, but common, clean and pure, but common. And then you had that which was clean and pure and holy. And we see this in the priesthood as well. The priests were to be on the verge in that liminal space between the holiness of the tabernacle and the purity of the camp, the cleanness of the people. This is why it was important for priests to not make themselves unclean. If they were unclean, they couldn't serve as priests because they bordered between the holiness of God and the purity within the camp. The lay people, the normal Israelites, they lived in this liminal space between the cleanliness of the camp and the tabernacle, the purity of this holy area, and the uncleanness of the surrounding outside world. So uh, an Israelite could become unclean, and it wasn't a big deal, as long as they performed the rituals and the ceremonies that moved them back into the realm of clean and not let themselves linger in uncleanness for a long time. It was fine. It was expected that as an Israelite, you would become unclean. So this is the first concept that's important to understand when we're entering into the world of the ancient Israelite sacrificial system. Unclean doesn't equal sinful, but sinful is inherently unclean, if that makes sense. There are things that are unclean that aren't sin, but all sin renders someone unclean. So they would be slightly overlapping realms. And likewise, something could be clean, but not necessarily be holy. Because holiness had to do with use by God within the realm of the tabernacle and the altar and his presence. So this is, this is how we need to think of the concepts of clean, unclean, holy, common, it'll help us understand and see the symbolism in Israel's sacrificial system a lot easier. Now, one of the scholars who's done the most work on this concept of holiness, particularly Levitical holiness, is Jewish scholar Jacob Milgram. Now, this is the condensed version of his Leviticus commentary. The actual one that I'm going to cite from in a second is his large three-volume set in the Anchor Bible commentary. But Milgram has explored in exhaustive detail. If you don't believe me, just do a page count on his three-volume Leviticus commentary. He's written exhaustively on the concept of holiness in Leviticus and what that means for Israel. And he makes this same point that I'm talking about. In his commentary, he has this little diagram. This is how he lays it out. You have holy and then you have common. And then you have pure, and then you have impure. And there's a little bit of overlap between common and pure. So he explains that in the commentary. He says, persons and objects are subject to four possible states, holy, common, pure, and impure. Two of them can exist simultaneously, either holy or common, and either pure or impure. Still, one combination is excluded in the priestly system, whereas the common may be either pure or impure. The sacred may never be impure. And that's why I laid them out this way. This box, sacred, holy, never touches this box, impure. So, for example, the layman, which is common, the normal Israelite, is assumed to be pure unless polluted by some impurity, such as a carcass, and that's detailed in Leviticus chapter 11, scale disease or skin disease, and that's detailed in Leviticus 13 and 14, Genital flow, whether male or female, any loss of bodily fluids, that's covered in chapters 12 through 15, or a corpse, which is mentioned in Numbers 19. So these are all ways that an average Israelite could become impure, accidentally even. And for all of these things, purification procedures are prescribed. So if you become unclean, impure in Israel, there are procedures you follow and then you become clean again. There's neither danger nor liability for the layman who contracts impurity as long as he does not allow it to be prolonged. Not so for the sacred, the priests, those serving in the presence of God. The sanctuary, for example, must at all times remain pure. Impurity befalling it must immediately be purged lest the whole community become blighted. So this is why there's such emphasis in 
the Torah on there being a buffer between the tabernacle and the camp. Nothing impure can enter the tabernacle. Now, impure, again, it doesn't necessarily mean sinful, although sin is impure, but there are also other things that aren't sinful, but they're impure. And so in this object lesson, God has set it up so those things are not to have contact with the tabernacle, which is like the earthly epicenter of holiness. So for instance, this is why the Levitical families, the families of the Levites are camped around the tabernacle in the wilderness so that no one from the camp can just walk into the precincts. This explains a number of things in the Old Testament. For example, the story of Phineas. If you read in the book of Numbers, an Israelite man took a pagan woman into the temple precincts and started engaging in sexual acts with her in the very presence, in the tabernacle. That's what stirred Phineas's zeal to such a high degree was that it wasn't just, oh, I don't like these people committing lewd acts. No, there was nothing more defiling that you could have intentionally, provocatively chosen to do within the Israelite camp than commit a wanton pagan sexual act in the very courtyard of God's tent. And so that explains Phineas's extreme reaction to it in that moment. If you don't know that story, we talk about it here on our series where we walk through the book of Numbers. So you can check that out. The link will be in the description below. But it all had to do with maintaining the holiness, the purity of the tabernacle itself. So Milgram goes on, the common is contiguous to the realms of the pure and the impure. So common things can be either impure or pure, but the sacred is contiguous only to the pure. It may not contact the impure. So the sacred borders the common and the pure, but never the impure. These two categories, holy and impure, are antagonistic, totally opposite. They are antonyms. Moreover, and this is the key part, they are dynamic. They seek to extend their influence and control over the other two categories, the common and the pure. In contrast to the former, the latter two categories are static. They cannot transfer their state. There is no contagious purity or contagious commonness. Indeed, they are in effect secondary categories. They take their identity from their antonyms. Purity is the absence of impurity, Commonness is the absence of holiness. Hence, the boundaries between the holy and the common and between the pure and the impure are represented by a broken line. That's what he's talking about with these dotted lines here on his little diagram. There's no fixed boundary. So this is important. When he talks about these categories being dynamic, seeking to extend their influence, what he's saying is holiness radiates outward and God's holiness is is intended to spread into the realm of the common, making pure what was once impure. And impurity, uncleanness, is also contagious, defiling, and it seeks to spread its influence into the common, rendering it impure. So holy and impure are kind of like the, the two ends of the spectrum. So then applying this object lesson to ethics, Israel, by its behavior, can move the boundaries either way. But it's enjoined to move in one direction only, to advance the holy into the realm of the common and to diminish the impure and thereby enlarge the realm of the pure. So the world of the common, the world, like creation, everything is common. It's either pure or impure. And God's holiness is intended to be spread throughout the world by his holy people being as we've seen in Exodus 19 with their call, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. This is what Israel is called to do. And the tabernacle is the object lesson meant to teach them the concept that they are then to transfer into the realm of their ethics. And that's the key. The object lesson itself is not magical. The object, the tabernacle, even the temple later, has no intrinsically magical properties. This is what gets Israel into trouble later. Israel, later in their history, after the temple's built, 
after the time of David and then Solomon and then the divided empire, Israel, the people are thinking, well, the temple's standing. We're still doing the rituals. We're offering the sacrifices. So therefore, nothing bad can happen to us because the temple of the Lord is there. And the prophets come to Israel and they're like, why do you say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord? God doesn't care about this house. He will leave it in a heartbeat. And in Ezekiel, he actually does. The presence of God in the vision of Ezekiel leaves the temple. And the temple itself is then destroyed and Israel is sent into exile. See, the whole purpose of the temple and the tabernacle and the system of sacrifices was to be what reminded Israel of their ethical calling to live out that system in the realm of their interpersonal relationships and their relationships with the peoples around them. So in Micah, when the people are asking God, what do you want us to bring? Do you want us to bring 10,000 rivers of oil? Do you want us to bring the best of our livestock? We'll even sacrifice our firstborn. And God says, no, he's told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? He's pointing them back to the purpose of the symbols, the purpose of the object lesson not the logistics, not the maintenance of the object itself. He wants his people to be the type of people that expand his holiness out into the world of impurity, uncleanness of those who don't know God. Israel is to radiate outward and they're to guard against the impurity of the world encroaching inward. That's what the whole Old Testament holiness system is there for. And the tabernacle itself with its tripartite structure that we've looked at in previous video, it communicates this. The laws on clean versus unclean in Leviticus 12 through 15, those are symbolized by these three divisions. You have the worship assembly, that's holy, people coming together. Then you have life in the camp, just normal life of the average Israelite in the camp. And that's common, but it's pure. And then you have life outside the camp. And that's where you enter the realm of the profane or the impure. And so to move into each section in holiness requires purification in proportion to that section you're moving into. So to move from outside the camp with, say you have a disease or something and you perform a ritual, now, once the disease is done, you know, the skin disease or discharge or something on the scalp or rash or whatever, the priest inspects you. Once it's over and you've done the ceremonial washing, you can move back into the camp. You are now clean, but you're not holy. Doesn't mean you go barge into the tabernacle itself. No, you're in the camp. But then before you go to worship, before you go to participate in the sacrificial system, there are more rituals that have to take place before you can enter because now you're in the presence of God himself. And remember, this is all an object lesson. This is, it's not magic, it's theology. It's teaching through image. It's teaching through physical, tactile. All of your senses are engaged, your sight, your smell, your taste, your touch, your hearing. All of those senses are at work in the Israel holiness, tabernacle, Levitical system. It also reflects the concept of holiness and all of humanity. Just like you have those three divisions of the tabernacle in terms of holiness, that is meant to reflect the divisions of humanity in terms of holiness. So on the outside, you have Gentiles, those who are unclean. They're outside of Israel. This is why Gentiles were seen as unclean, because they were outside of the covenant people of God. However, Gentiles could move into the covenant people of God and did. There are many Gentiles in the Old Testament who were considered Israelites. There's a whole book named after one of them, Book of Ruth. So it's not like these are ethnic boundaries. And that's another thing to keep in mind. It's not ethnic boundaries. It's covenant boundaries. So being a Gentile was not just a matter of birth and being an Israelite was not just a matter of birth. Both were a matter of what covenant are you in? What God have you entered into covenant with? What community do you identify with? Are you a Canaanite, but you identify with the Israelites in their worship of God? Well, then like Rahab at Jericho, you're welcomed into the people of God. Are you an Israelite, but your actions are like those of the Canaanites? 
Well, then like Achan and his family, you are excluded from the covenant relationship with God. So the borders were fluid and people could come and go. It wasn't ethnicity based, but it was community based. So outside of the community of Israel, you had the Gentiles. Then you had the Israelites who were clean, but the Israelites were not all necessarily holy. They couldn't just walk into God's presence within the Israelites you had the Levites, the tribe of Levi, they were holy. They were used by God for a specific purpose, which is what holiness means. So they were set apart, which is literally what holiness means, from the rest of Israel, just as Israel was set apart from the rest of the nations. So as the Levites were to be the priests between Yahweh and Israel, so the Israelites as a whole were to be the priests between Yahweh and the Gentile world. And so this is the calling of Israel, to be the representative of God in the midst of the Gentile nations, just as the tribe of Levites were representative of God to their fellow Israelites. This three-part structure when it comes to holiness is really important to grasp. And Milgram has showed how it extends in other areas as well. It applies to space, It applies to persons, and it even applies to animals. So space, you have the sanctuary where the priests reside. Then outside of that, you have the land, Israel, and the sojourner. And then outside of Israel, the boundaries of Israel, you have the earth where humanity dwells, the nations. And so as you move from the outside to the inside, you increase in your level of holiness. And as something moves from the inside to the outside, it decreases in its holiness. So of all the earth, the land of Israel in the Old Covenant was seen as more holy. And then within the land of Israel in the Old Covenant, the sanctuary was seen as the most holy place. You see, this is people as well. Like we just said, you have the priests and those in the tribe of Levite. Then you have all of Israel, And then you have all of mankind. And we're going to talk about this in our next video, particularly, it applies to animals. You have the animals that can be offered as sacrifices. Then you have the clean animals, which are only a few, the animals that can be eaten. Then you have all the animals, all the animals in all of creation. So again, the further you move from the center, the set-apartness decreases. Seeing these grades of holiness in the Old Testament helps us then understand what God was teaching Israel about himself and what he was teaching Israel about themselves. That's the key. Remember, it's not about maintaining a ritual system just to have a ritual system. It's not magic. The difference between magic and faith magic and true religion. Magic assumes that by doing procedures, you can manipulate forces to get what you want. That's how sorcery works. That's how witchcraft works. That's how all of those superstitious practices work. True religion is not magic. True religion is you don't perform a certain deed, say a certain word, invoke a certain God, and then they have to do what you say because you spoke the right spell or provided the right gift or did the right incantation ritual. True religion is you perform what God has asked of you in obedience to God from a heart of thankfulness for what God has already done for you. And then you ask God, like one would ask a loving parent, for what it is that you want. And regardless of whether or not God says yes or no, Regardless of whether he gives you or he withholds from you, you still offer your worship. You still perform the duties that he asks because those aren't tied to an outcome in this earthly realm. That's the difference between ritualistic and authentic. And God always wants authentic. In fact, God even says in the Old Testament, if he doesn't have the authentic, if he doesn't have Israel's heart, then their sacrifices are noxious to him. Their songs are noise to him. Their offerings are garbage to him. He desires chesed, not sacrifice. Chesed is usually translated as mercy or faithfulness or loving kindness or something like that. It doesn't really have a good English equivalent, but it's the Hebrew concept for covenant faithfulness and benevolent action toward those who are in no position to return the favor. So that's why it gets translated as loving kindness or mercy or whatever. That's what God wants. And that's what the sacrificial system and the Levitical 
tabernacle itself was set up to communicate to Israel through images, symbolism, tactile involvement. Because unlike us in the modern world who learn primarily through mental accumulation of ideas and systematic presentation of timeless axioms and truths, in the ancient world and in many cultures around the world today, people learn primarily through ritual, through practice, through physical, tangible interaction. And that's what God gave Israel in the Sinai Covenant. I've mentioned before a great resource on Exodus, Chris Wright's commentary in the Story of God Bible Commentary series. He makes a fantastic observation about holiness. He says, God is saying to Israel as a whole community, you will be for me to all the rest of the nations what your priests are to you. Through you, I will make myself known to the world. And ultimately through you, I will draw the world into covenant relationship with myself. A whole nation living by such standards would indeed be distinctive, holy, a contrast society different enough to draw curiosity from surrounding peoples not only as regards the God they worship, but also through the quality of social justice they embodied. Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8. Oh, there's a typo. I'm fixing it live on camera. We don't hide how the sausage gets made here at Disciple Dojo. The beauty of technology. So, being holy, in other words, like being priestly, had an outward orientation for the sake of God's purpose for Israel in the midst of the nations. Being holy was about radiating outwardly the holiness of God to an unholy world. Both parts of Israel's identity, priestly kingdom and holy nation, are fundamentally missional when seen in the light of the story of God's mission launched with the universal vision of the Abrahamic covenant. What Wright's talking about there is what we've talked about in our Old Testament in under an hour video, in our video here on the most important concept in biblical theology. When God called Abraham and his seed, his offspring, back in Genesis 12, 15, and 17, he entered into covenant with Abraham. And the promise that he made in this covenant was through you, you and your seed, your family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So then at Sinai, God gives Israel the covenant. He enters into covenant with them, what we've been looking at in this entire series. He states it in Leviticus 18 through 20 in the holiness code. And he sums it up at the beginning and at the end of the book of Deuteronomy before Moses dies and sends Israel into the promised land. All of this emphasizes that Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel here, Israel as a whole are to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They are to stand between God and all the nations of the earth. And they are to represent God to all the nations. And through Israel living as God's covenant people, they don't keep the covenant so that they will be saved. That's a later Protestant misunderstanding of the Old Testament. No, Israel already was saved. They keep the covenant because it's who they are and so that the nations looking at Israel will see their relationship with God and the nations will be drawn to know this God of Israel. This is the plan of the Old Testament. This is the purpose of the Old Testament. And in the next video, we're gonna look at how this plan of the Old Testament gets transformed in the New Testament and what that means for us today. And we're gonna look at it primarily as it's expressed through Israel's dietary laws in Leviticus chapter 11. But to sum up, when you think about the concepts of holy, unholy, pure, impure, clean, unclean, this is the paradigm that you have to keep in mind. All of the world is either holy, which means set apart, or it's common, which means normal. And within the common, things are either pure and clean, which means that they are then able to be set apart, or they're impure and unclean, which means they cannot be set apart. And Within Israel, the people inhabited this area, and in their daily lives, they did things all the time that would render them unclean, and the purpose of the Levitical purity system was to bring them back into the realm of the clean so that then they could enter into the holy when they participate in corporate worship. So holiness primarily doesn't have to do with whether somebody plays cards or dances or watches R-rated movies or any of those things, although those will come into play when we start to look at what does it mean to live a holy life in today's world. But 
we have to keep in mind what holiness originally meant and what it was originally intending to communicate to God's people under the old covenant. Only when we understand that can we then see how under the new covenant we are to embody that same concept in a very different setting under very different circumstances but without changing the goal or the overall mission. That's the challenge of Old Testament interpretation. That's the challenge of reading and studying the law. That's the challenge of trying to find the application for passages that have to deal with the tabernacle, the temple, cleanliness, holiness, washing, purification. So taking those rules, those passages, those laws in isolation and just trying to do the ones we can do is not the way to go. Doing what A.J. Jacobs did in the year of living biblically, where he just tried for a whole year to literally keep the commandments in the Torah as best as he could, it may make for an interesting book, and this was an entertaining read, but it has nothing to do with biblical holiness, either in the Old Covenant or in the New Covenant. So we have to see the law as a whole. We have to see the system as a whole before we start to look at the individual laws or the individual practices. Otherwise, it just looks like a jumble of instructions with no discernible purpose. If any of this interests you more and you want to go deeper, here on the Disciple Dojo podcast, as well as our YouTube channel, we have teaching series that walk through the books of the Torah chapter by chapter. I'll link those playlists, both video and podcast, in the description below. So if you're struggling with how to read and interpret those later chapters of Exodus, check out our series on Exodus, God is King. If you wonder what Leviticus has to do with you today, go through our series, Leviticus, the book Christians usually skip. If you're unfamiliar with the story of Numbers and the Tabernacle in the wilderness, then check out Numbers, Into the Wild. And if you want to see Moses' final words to God's people before he dies and they enter into the land, then check out Deuteronomy, the heart of God's people. All of these resources are free and they're available here, either podcast or video through the Ministry of Disciple Dojo. And the only way we can do that is because you, people like you watching this, decide, I want to support this teaching ministry because I think these resources are good. So if that's you, and if you do enjoy this teaching ministry, we would love it if you would become a partner. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We exist entirely on donations. So I will put a link in the description below to how you can support this ministry here at Disciple Dojo. The more support we have, the more resources we're able to make available completely free, and the better we are able to equip, engage, and empower God's people in their biblical discipleship. So thanks for watching. See you back here next time when we take a look at the Levitical food laws and what those mean for God's people under the old covenant and God's people in the new covenant. And then after that, we'll wrap up this series with the Eden imagery of the Sinai tabernacle and the temple. So be sure to subscribe and click the notifications button so you don't miss any of it. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo.